All right, first of all, I'd like to have a very brief uh, clarification of the last lecture. So here we talk about that typically two different cell will share a bit line. And actually here there's one mistake. So here, even though two cells share the same bit line, but actually those two cells are controlled by different word lines. So there will be no conflict. So actually, if you look at the layout here, so those two cells share the same bit line, but those two cells are controlled by two different word lines here. So when you activate the D run array, it's always you only activate one word line. So then you either activate this word line or the other word line. So you will only activate one cell that's attached to this bit line. So there will be no conflict. All right, so that's this clarification. And then let's move on to the time means we discussed. So here we can have a step-by-step -step, uh, observation of the time means diagram. So here this is the peripheral circuit as we discussed last time. So in the middle we have this blue part that is the sense amplifier. So it's a latch based sense amplifier controlled by this enable signal of the sense amp. And then the red part is the equalized circuit. And then we have the green part. This is the, the collect part to transfer the data in and out to the external data bus. And here we show the DRAM cell. It's 1T1C. And DRAM is attached to the, here the bit line true. And then we have another like bit line complementary. So this is the two inputs to the differential uh, input of the sense amplifier. So at the initial stage, so those preferred circuits, most of them will be off. So the only part that is will be on is this uh, equalized circuit. So basically you want to pre-charge bit line and bit line bar be both half VDD. So here you have half VDD on both sides. And then now the word line is turned on. So here the word line is turned on. So this is, uh, before you do that, of course, you need to turn off the equalized circuit. And then you turn on the word line. After you turn on the word line, as we discussed, depending on the data you store on the storage node here, if it stores one, then this one will charge up the bit line by this positive delta V. If it stores zero, then it will discharge the bit line by negative delta V. So in this case, it stores one. So here we assume it's starting at one. So then it will charge up the bit line by delta V. And then this is the charge sharing process as we discussed. So you can go over this process by yourself and all the signals uh, that are controlled this peripheral circuits are listed on the right hand side. So you know which signal is on and off at uh, each step of the process. So we will go through this quickly because we have already discussed the details in the previous lecture. So the first phase is the charge sharing. You develop the delta V. Here is the delta V you develop. And then it's time to turn on the sense amp enable. So here are those two are the sense amp enable. So after you turn on the sense amp enable, then the, the middle part here will start working. And then on this side, you have the half VDD plus delta V. On the other side, it's a reference. So it's half VDD then the latch will start flipping, right? This will go to VDD, the other side will go to ground, go to ground. So this is the, uh, the sense amp. And then once the bit time two goes to VDD and the bit line uh, complementary goes to ground. That means this is the sense is complete. Now you can turn on this 
CSL pulse to transfer the data out because now here you will have the digital one and uh, then you can get this digital one out by turn on this pass gate transistor so this is at this stage you have the CSL pulse and then after the data is transferred out of course you will close the CSL and then the followed by this let's do a write operation so you want to change the data from 1 to 0 so what you need to do is to first prepare the data now you need to turn on the CSL again so at this moment the new data is already uh, being prepared as a output buffer and so this will be transferred in so this here you need to prepare the data to be zero so that one will basically discharge the bit line to be ground so that means here is bit line will go to ground and then the bit line this is bit line true and then bit line complementary will go opposite to the VDD so this is uh, to prepare the data to be written and then you close the collect part so here this one is already VDD so this VDD is uh, already, already ground so this will discharge the DRAM cell so the DRAM cell will be written to ground so this is how the DRAM cell the blue curve here is the DRAM storage node VSN so this voltage will decay to ground so this is how you write zero this is write zero and after the write is complete then you can close this row so that means you turn off the word line the word line turns off and after that then we turn on the equalize circuit to pre-charge both VDD, so pre-charge both bitlan B and bitlan C to be half VDD. And then this is the final stage. So this is the step-by-step -step operation of the DRAM row cycle. This one row cycle includes a read followed by a write. And this row cycle time, as we discussed before, typically in like uh, 30 nanoseconds, 40 nanoseconds. But the data in and out is controlled by this CSL, and this one can be in like 5 nanosecond clock cycle. Therefore, the clock frequency, as we discussed, internally to the DRAM's core will be in this 200 megahertz around that. This is determined by the CSL. Any questions? All right, so then let's move on to the DRAM data retention. So this is a unique feature to the DRAM, and this is why DRAM is called DRAM, dynamic random access memory. This is because the DRAM cannot hold the data forever. There's a leakage uh, will decay the storage node for example, if your storage node stores one, that VDD on the capacitor will decay over time. And also, if you store zero, that zero will increase the voltage over time as well. So one will become zero, and zero become one as time goes by. And the typical retention time is only a few. There will be a distribution of the retention time. We will see that in the next slide. But before that, I just want to ask you one question. Let's say if the DRAM's data cannot be held forever, if you want to refresh the DRAM's data, what would you do? Do you want to do a read operation or do you want to do a write operation? Any idea? So what you suggest is to do a read first and then we do a write. 
uh, actually, you don't need the second write operation because the read, as we discussed before, will automatically recover the data, right? Because there is a built in write back process. Once you read, then you automatically write back. So here I want to point out this refresh is naturally performed by the read. Okay. You don't need a write because write is built in. So It's the same as read. Basically, it's a read operation. The refresh is a is the same as read operation. We will talk about the the exact operation sequence later. But it's no difference with with read. Okay. Uh, we will go to that point uh, in the next few slides. But basically, if you do the refresh, you cannot do other things. So we will talk about that in the next. So the retention time here of the DRAM chip across the cells, there will be a variation. So some cells can sustain the data for a longer time, and some cells may sustain the data with a shorter time. So here, this is the, the cumulative probability measured from a DRAM chip. Uh, let's say you have like a millions of cells on the chip, if you measure individually, then this is the distribution of the retention time. Retention means how long you can hold the data before the error happens. So this is the, the distribution. So you can see that most of the cells can sustain the data for here, for example, here this is like uh, one second, right? So this is like 99%, actually 99.9% .9 of the cells can hold the data larger than one second. So here only the tail, because this is in the log scale. So here the tail, there's like, a, for example, the probability one out of one million cells will only have the retention time less than, let's say, here is a 64 millisecond. So one out of one million cells may have the 64 millisecond retention time. But you DRAM chip, you know, today you have gigabytes. One out of one million actually will give you like thousands of cells fail in a gigabyte DRAM chip. Therefore, here, according to the JEDEC, which is the organization to define the industry and like I.O. interface protocol, the JEDEC requires the DRAM to be refreshed every 64 milliseconds to prevent those tail bits be failed. So let's talk about the DRAM refresh cycle to answer some of the questions you raised. So here, as we discussed, the typical refresh period or refresh cycle is 64 milliseconds. So that means each cell is periodically refreshed, refreshed as we discussed, read at interval of this 64 milliseconds. This is the this interval. So what does that mean? Typically, the refresh is uniformly distributed across the array. So think about your array may have a number of rows in the DRAM bank, for example. So here, then what you should do is, for example, and this is the time, and time equals to zero, you start with the first word line, the WL1, at this moment, you do the refresh to the VLAN 1. So that means you read the first row of the array. And you need to spend the cycle time, T cycle time. For example, here, we say 40 nanoseconds. This is the same as a normal read. You need to turn on that VLAN, and then after that, you need to close that VLAN. 
So this is like one row cycle time. So you spend 40 nanoseconds to read that row. You can read all the columns simultaneously. If you if each column is equipped with a consent. So you do that. And after that, okay, then you can do your normal random access. Normal random access means you can go to any rows depending on the address from the host or depending on your program. You want to access certain rows to get the data or write the new data in. Doesn't matter. So you do your normal random access. And then after some time, then you need to go to the second second word line. So you see that the refresh here basically is performed by pointing the address to certain rows at certain time interval. So here we can calculate what is the time interval here between the first row and the second row. Right. So that means at this moment here, you cannot do anything else. You must go to the Verlan 2 to do the refresh. So basically read Verlan 2. And then you can repeat that after some interval. And then finally, you should go back to the first Verlan. And this is, uh, for example, 64 milliseconds. So after 64 milliseconds, you should go to the first Verlan. So let's do one example here to calculate what is the percentage of the time you used for the refresh. So for example, we discussed here the test row cycle time is 40 milliseconds. And in this example, you have 16, 16K rows in this array. And uh, the T refresh cycle is 64 milliseconds. Then the question for you is, uh, how much percentage of your time you spend on the refresh? So how do you approach this question? So here in total, you have 64 milliseconds, right? From word on one to word on one. So how many word lines you have? How many rows? So it says 16K. So that means here, from word on one to word on two, you should wait for 64 milliseconds divided by 16k, right? So this gives you four microseconds, I believe. Four microseconds. And then each refresh, or let's say the word line through cycle time is 40 nanoseconds. So basically you use 40 nanoseconds out of this 4 microseconds to do this refresh. So this gives you 1% of the time, right? Because the rest, 99% of the time, you can do the random access. But at this, you must spend this 1% of the time, go to this particular address, and read that particular row. And you cannot miss that. If you miss that, that row may suffer from error. Is this clear? Let me see if there are any questions online. Okay, does this answer your question? More questions? Oh, this 64 milliseconds is, the question is, how does we come up with 64 milliseconds, right? So this is uh, defined by the JDEC. Uh, this is an organization to standardize the interface protocol. And uh, of course, this is uh, empirically measured from the statistics of the chip. And the most of the chip may have this kind of distribution as we show in this. A graph. So of course you can change that. I mean, if you define the standard, you, you can change it to 128 milliseconds, for example, then of course there will be a trade-off, right? You may have 
uh, if it's 128 milliseconds, then you have higher probabilities to get an error, right? That means you should uh, maybe enhance your ECC error correction capability, but you can reduce the percentage of the time that you spend on the refresh, right? So there will be trade-off. All right, then let's talk about what contribute to the leakage of the DRAM cell. There are several mechanisms that contribute to the leakage of the DRAM cell. Because this capacitor here, you know, is the one T1C, right? So we have this transistor control this capacitor. So this storage node, for example, you stores one, so you have positive charges at this node. So this one may leak over time through the following mechanisms. The first one is uh, here, the number one here, the pin junction leakage. So what's that? So here, this is, uh, because this is one, this is like higher potential, so this is the drain, right? Drain of the transistor. So the drain is N plus, you know, this is uh, N plus doping, and the substrate is P well. So here, essentially, the substrate is biased to ground or even negative bias. So the point is that there is a PN junction here between your drain and the substrate or your core body. So this drain to body, PN junction is reversed. This is reversed. If you recall the PN diode, IV, right? So you have this reverse current through this junction. So that means this will leak the charges at this node. And the second effect is called Guido. We will discuss that more in the next slide. So this is also the current that passes from the drain to the body, but through a different mechanism called gate induced drain leakage. We will discuss that in the next slide. So this is again from the drain to the body. And number three here is the subthreshold leakage. So this is what we have discussed before. So this is off state current of the transistor. And I hope you can still recall the transistor subthreshold loop at the ID in the log scale. Right, versus the VGS, and we have this substitution slope, and then this is I off. You you will have this I off because the transistor source and drain, even though your gate is uh, zero in the retention mode, if you don't do the read or write, then your word line is closed, right? The word line is zero, but still you will have the I off current from VDD to ground because of this sub-threshold uh, leakage of the transistor. And uh, lastly, of course, there might be leakage directly through the capacitor. If the capacitor is not perfect, if you have a defect, then there may be a current directly through the trans uh, capacitor. But this is, uh, I would say, very minimal effect. Ideally, you should have, should have a good capacitor there. So the number one, two, three here are the most important factors to determine the retention of this DRAS because you have the leakage to discharge this node. And if you consider the total leakage, this IL is the total leakage current. If you consider the total leakage current, your sense margin, this is the sense margin equation we discussed earlier. So you see this familiar, looks, this, looks, this looks familiar, right, this part. One over one plus Cb, the bit line capacitance, divided by the Cs, this is the, the storage node capacitance, and then times half VDD. So this will be your nominal sense margin. But if you consider the leakage, then your sense margin will be 
further reduced because initially if you wait for this retention refresh cycle right initially your voltage after the read or write operation immediately after that maybe you are at vdd but as time goes by then due to the decay then you may lose some voltage already and then at this moment if you turn on the word line and read it again so your starting point your starting point will be less so this this part is the decay this is the contribute by the leakage and this is your nominal sense margin but if you consider the decay then you should uh, minus this part and uh, why is this because this is uh, like i current and this t is time right this time you wait for the next operation so then this current times the time give you the charge and then charge divided by the capacitance of the storage node give you the voltage decay here so if you consider the decay then the sense margin will be further reduced and also from this equation you can back calculate what should be the refresh time cycle right if you know the other parameters like your sense margin you want to keep that for example 100 millivolts or 200 millivolts and then you know the cbl cs and the vdd and if you know the leakage here or the components of the leakage then you can back calculate what should be the refresh refresh time so any questions here So this is uh, the leakage uh, when the capacitor stores one. Yes, but even when the capacitor stores zero, the zero will also increase because it will charge back. Uh, you will not get this like a reverse junction, but the I off is still there. If you if you have the zero, right? If you think about you store zero here, and uh, actually the bit now as we discussed, this should be not be uh, uh, zero, should be half VDD, because we we'll always precharge bit line to be half VDD, right? So let's say this is half VDD. Then this will still charge back, right? So in this case, you will have the leakage to decay or di to discharge the one node. But in the other hand, here you will have the off current to charge up. So, any questions? Okay. Then let's talk about what is the second component of the leakage. This gate induced the drain current Guido effect. So this is uh, when the actually we briefly talk about this in the famous review section. So when the gate voltage smaller than the drain, also smaller than the source, this is for a MOS, okay? Then you will have this Guido current. So this is essentially caused by the band to band parallel, BT BT. So think about this. This is uh, uh, along this direction. If you draw the band diagram, then this is uh, your gate. This is your oxide, and this is your substrate. So in this region, because the gate voltage is negative than your drain voltage, negative voltage, your VGS, negative VGS, will raise up the band. So when you look at the band diagram, the principle is always the positive voltage will push down the band and then the negative voltage will raise up the band. The reason is that the band diagram is respect to the energy of the electron, right? Positive voltage will make the energy of the electron lower, 
and the negative voltage will make the electron energy higher because the electron is negative charge. So here, the VGS negative will make basically increase the Fermi function, Fermi level of the gate, and then the silicon band in the substrate will be bent like this. So if it's, uh, this is a conduction band, this is valence band. Hope you can still recall your undergrad device physics. As I said, one of the prerequisites of this course is undergrad device physics. So here, if this is very bent, okay, so here you see that the electrons are in the valence band, and this electrons may have higher energy than the edge of the conduction band, you see. So that means if the electron is here, then it can turn through the band directly. Because here, this is like, uh, there are many like, uh, empty states in the conduction band. So if the electron has higher energy than the empty states in the conduction band, then this may happen. So this is called band-to-band -band turn only. Once you create electron, let's say you have one electron turn off from the valence band to the conduction band, what you leave behind is a hole. So essentially, you, you create electron and hole pair. And this hole will be left in the substrate. And the hole will not go anywhere but sink to the ground. And if your substrate is biased to zero or even negative voltage, the holes will contribute to this whole current. This is also similar to the like, uh, radiation effect we discussed earlier in the s run section. If you have photo current to ge generate, I mean, the strike of the high energy particle from the cosmic ray, when you create this electron hole pair, and hole will go to the substrate. So in this case, the band to band turning creates the hole, and hole will go to the substrate. So this is exactly the same current here. This hole current will leak the storage node charges. And uh, from the IDV, G curve, actually you can see this leakage current due to the gate. So if you, this is, uh, this part is MMOS, this part is PMOS. So for MMOS, if you bias the gate voltage to be negative, so this is our nominal IO. But if you bias your gate voltage to be negative, then you will see an increase of the drain current. This is uh, due to the gate effect, this part. Normally, you will not show that because in the normal logic transistor operation, your MMOS will not have negative uh, gate to drain voltage. But in this particular case, you will have that. Why is that? Let's look at the D run retention mode voltage biases. So, what do you apply voltage here? Will affect the leakage. So here, let's assume it stores one. So this storage node is the VDD. And the word line is closed. The word line is zero. And as we discussed, the bit line is typically pre-charged to be half VDD to make it ready for the next read operation. So you have half VDD here. So that's the bias you have. And then the I off the substrate leakage will flow this way, right? Because the drain, this is drain, this is source. You still have half VDD across that. So you have I off. And here you see the VGD is negative. So that means this will give you the Gido current. And then the junction here is a reverse biased. So the substrate Sometimes you can bias to be negative. If you want to reduce this I off, you can bias your substrate to be negative. But that will enlarge the junction current.
and also for the VLAN, you can also bias the VLAN to be active. So this one can be VBBW, like active 0.5 volts. So this is to further reduce this I off, but it will enlarge the ghetto current. So there will be trade-offs between those three components of the current. So you have to optimize the bias to minimize the total leakage. For different technology node, maybe the contribution will be uh, relatively different. But here, no matter what, storing data 1 is more difficult than storing data 0. Why is that? Because storing data 0, this IJ is less. This is the junction, right? If you store 1, then this reverse bias across the junction will be larger than storing 0. No junction, so here is junction, right? If you store, for example, if your VPB is uh, negative 0.5 volts, if you store 1, you have the VDD here. If you store 0, then you only have this negative 0.5 volts. So the junction current is less when you store 0 than storing 1. So here, for the DRAM retention, we mostly care about the storing 1 instead of storing 0. So any questions? Okay, so this is a static mode of the retention. Static mode means you just keep the bias there and you do nothing, okay? You just uh, hold the data. But the dynamic mode of the DRAM retention means that for the laboring rows, you are doing dynamic operations. For example, if you are read or write the adjacent row, then your victim row will suffer from more leakage. For example, this is uh, the, the cell that under retention, but the adjacent row is is performing the right operation. Right. If you write this uh, the adjacent row, for example here, then you need to make the bit line to be zero, right? To write this write this cell, you need to make this to be zero. So this will enlarge the I of current because this will become zero. And if this stores one, you have VDD here. So you have larger I off than the static case. Because static case, we typically bias the bit line to be half VDD, right? So in this case, you have half VDD and VDD. And in this dynamic operation, because the other cell is being written, so you bias the bit line to be zero. So in this case, you have a VDD across this transistor. Therefore, you have larger sub-threshold leakage. And also, there's a so-called Ruhammer effect discovered, discovered in the recent years uh, in the most advanced DRAM. It suffers from this Ruhammer effect. This Ruhammer effect means if you keep activating the adjacent row. For example, you do the word line, you turn on the word line and turn off the word line to read and write multiple times for the adjacent row. Because of the coupling, there will be an electricity cap coupled between two word lines. So here, when you turn on the word line of the adjacent row, then due to the capacitive coupling, so this word line is somehow also kind of turned on a little bit, a little bit. So this will enlarge the current here. 
this will accelerate the decay of the storage node when you store one. So this row hammer effect sometimes is uh, leveraged as a mechanism to, I mean, spy the adversary to attack your DRAM system. So if uh, they can write a code, software code, to intentionally keep reading certain rows, so your data on the adjacent road will be damaged if you keep reading the same row. So they can write programs to attack your DRAM system intentionally. So this is the so-called row hammer effect, and this is one of big one of the biggest challenges in the DRAM system today. This is due to the capacitive coupling between two VLANs because nowadays the VLANs are so close to each other. So you, you can think of that the capacitance between two wires, if the distance between those two wires become close, that means the capacitance will increase. So the voltage can be coupled from one wire to another wire. So any questions here? So then that means we have to do the DRAM refresh more often. So here, this is a study from some architect, computer architect. So this is an estimation at the system level. The percentage of the time spent on the refresh depends on the capacity of the DRAM chip. So here, if the capacity increases, you see that like 64 gigabit DRAM chip, we need to spend like more than 40% of the time doing the refresh. And also, energy-wise, we need to spend a lot of energy doing the refresh. So the refresh is meaningless for your system performance, because during the refresh, you cannot do anything else. You must go to that particular address, activate that particular row, and read that, read that row. It will not help with your application. So it's a waste of the system's energy and latency. All right, any questions before we move on? Okay, next we will talk about some DRAM technology uh, from the DRAM cell structure point of view and also the layout and array architecture point of view. First, let's talk about the DRAM cell technology. Uh, the first type of the DRAM is based on this trench capacitor Cell. So here, this is uh, used in the standalone DRAM. Uh, in the old days, let's say if the feature size is more than 70 nanometer, you will typically see this kind of a trench capacitor DRAM. But this is no longer in production, you know, 70 nanometer for the standalone DRAM. So this is uh, from the historical respect. So here you see the DRAM capacitor is built into the substrate. So this is a trench in the substrate. That means on the silicon. Okay. What you will do is first dig a trench. You dig this trench into the silicon. And then you will fabricate the capacitor here. You will basically, for example, grow the like uh, the dielectric and uh, your oxide, for example. You need to have the capacitor, right? Dielectric and then you refill the middle as an electrode, and typically you can use polysilicon uh, doped. If you uh, uh, heavily dope the silicon, it becomes conductive, so you can use that as electrode, and this will attach to the drain of your transistor, so you can fabricate the transistor afterwards. So you can fabricate, after you fabricate the trench faster, then you can do your like DRAM source and drain, and then you can grow your, your oxide, and then make your transistor on the surface of the silicon. So this trench is embedded to the, to the substrate. And here are some images showing the trench. So here are the uh, uh, transistor uh, gate, and source and drain is here, and then you have a very deep DRAM trench. 
So here, this is not good. You know, we will discuss that later. The major challenge here is that it does not scale well beyond this 70 nanometer load. And it requires an 8F square uh, cell layout. And also, it's difficult to dig a, a very deep trench into the silicon. You have to refill the trench. And you have first to deposit the material to cover the surface or the side wall of the trench. And then you have to refill the trench with the middle electrode. So the process wise is also challenging. Um, but still, the trench cluster is still used today by, for example, IBM and the IBM's partner, you know, Global Foundry. This is used for the embedded DRAM process. We will discuss that in the last uh, section of this DRAM and lecture. But for standalone DRAM, this is no longer used. So here, this is uh, uh, another look at the last generation of the trench DRAM. So here is the aspect ratio. Here we talk about the aspect ratio. Aspect ratio means the diameter of the trench and then the height. So this aspect ratio is defined as the height of the trench divided by the diameter of the trench. So it's like 90 to 1. So this is very deep. And in this case, the dielectric used is uh, aluminum oxide. So this is not the generation of the DRAM using the trench cluster. And today's DRAM is based on this so-called stacked cluster. And here you see the cluster now is built on top of the transistor. And we have shown that in the very beginning of the DRAM section. So this allows the transition to 6F square open bit line architecture. We'll discuss that uh, in a minute. And all the major manufacturers use this open bit line architecture with the stack capacitor today, including Samsung Micron SK Hynix. So here the transistor is built first, and then the capacitor is standing on top of the drain. So then this is the electrode, and then this is another electrode. The another electrode is called the plate. And then here, between those two electrodes, you have the dielectric. And in today's DRAM, it uses high K dielectric. High K means high dielectric constant or the permittivity. So here are some images for the stacked capacitor. I think this is from some early stages of the stacked capacitor. Nowadays, the aspect ratio is also very high. So here is a comparison between the stacked capacitor and the trench capacitor. So the fabrication order is different. For the stacked capacitor, you fabric the transistor first and then the capacitor. But for the trench, then you fabric the trench first and then the transistor. So therefore, the trench capacitor is compatible with the logic process. So it, 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 it's compa uh, compatible with the logic. That's why this can be used as embedded DRAM for the on-chip uh, uh, DRAM on the same chip with your logic processor. Because you can fabricate the trench first, and then all the rest process will follow the same as the logic process. And the major challenge for the trench capacitor is that it's difficult to scale to 6F square. So we will discuss the layout in the next few slides. But before we talk about the layout, I think we want to first uh, talk about the array architecture. So the DRAM array, like rows and columns, and here, like the number of uh, cells along the column, along the bit line, is limited by the sense margin. Because we have the equations earlier, right? 
the sense margin depends on the baseline capacitance, and you want the baseline capacitance to be small. That means baseline has to be short. And then the word line is limited by the RC delay of the word line wire. So let's talk about the DRAM array architectures. There are two kinds of architecture. The first one is called folded baseline architecture, and this is used in the trench cluster. And then the second one is open baseline architecture. This is mostly used in today's stacked cluster. So let's look at what does this mean. So the folded baseline architecture here, let's look at this diagram. This is a simplified diagram. So here, let's say the rows are the word lines, and then the columns are the bit lines. And you know the word line and bit line, when they intersect, then you may have the DRAM cell, and DRAM cell is 1T1C, as we discussed before. So here we just use a circle to represent, to represent that 1T1C. So here, if you recall the DRAM uh, sensing, as we discussed, you have the bit line true and bit line complementary, right? You have the bit line true and bit line complementary. So you may wonder, where is the bit line complementary? Where does that come from? Because D run is different from the S run. When we talk about the S run, we have the bit line and bit line bar. So each S run cell has two bit lines. But for the D run, each D run cell only have one bit line. But still you have bit line C and bit line E here. What does that mean? So actually for the sense time, because you need the differential input, you have to borrow the bit line complementary from somewhere. So typically you can use another column to do that. Think about this. So let's say this is a differential input for the sense time, right? You have bit line two and bit line complementary. Actually, the bit line complementary is coming from some columns of the DRAM. So that's why here you see if this is the word line and this is the bit line C, that means you will have the bit, a bit line T. And bit line C needs to borrow from somewhere. So here you will have a DRAM cell here. So this is how you stack, uh, uh, twist the location of the DRAM cell. Here you see this is twisted. So here, let, let's draw this out so you may have seen this more clear. So let's say you have this uh, business C, and then you have the, when you say you have word line, that means you have, essentially you have this one. So that means here you have the word line to control the gate, and then you have this capacitor. So this is the, the cell here. So the bit line complementary, okay, as we discussed at the beginning of today's lecture, you cannot have one word line to control those two at the same time. So you have to use another word line here, and control another cell. So those are the two cells. You cannot have the cell share the same word line because when you turn on the word line, right? If you both bit line C and bit line P are activated, then you cannot sense because as we discussed earlier, the sense time, you want the, this one to be have, for example, VDD plus delta V. The other side is a reference. Reference means, sorry, half VDD. That means reference means you want to keep it at half VDD. So that means this one, for example, if you turn on this word line, the other word lines will be off. Okay, other word lines will be off. If it's off, then you know this bit line can be kept at half VDD. So this is called folded bit line architecture. And uh, you see you have to make a empty space here. 
So basically, as a stem word line, you cannot activate two cells of the bitline T and bitline C at the same time. That's why here you see this distribution of the cells is like uh, twisted in this way. So this gives you 8F square in the cell layout. Why is that? So very simple. So if you look at here, so that means each cell equivalently will take this space. Right. And uh, so one cell, here you have one word line, occupy one word line, and one cell occupy two bit line. Because the other bit line, if it's a complementary here, this is empty. You should have nothing there. Oops. See. So in other words, one B1 cell occupy one word line and two bit line. So you have your word line and bit line C and bit line T, for example. So one wire roughly give you 2F, right? Why is that? For wire, you have the wire, you have the spacing between wire. So one wire give you 2F. So here you occupy one wire line, so this side give you 2F. And the other side here, you have two lines here. That will give you 4F. So in total is 8F squared. So one wire gives you 2F because you need F for the wire and F for the spacing between wire. So this gives you 8F, 8F square. And then if you look at the open bit architecture on the other side, if you want, you want to get rid of this empty space, what you can do is to share the same sample not from the same array. This is one array, this is another array. Or let's say if you say this is one bank, this is another bank. So what you will do is, here the same sample is going to borrow the complementary line from the other bank. So when you operate the DRAM, you will only activate this bank. You will not activate the other bank. So the other bank can use as reference so here you can have the half VDD, and this side you have the half VDD plus delta V. Then you don't have conflict here because the word line of one bank. Banks are independent, right? So when you activate this word line, then the other word lines here will be zero. So that means you can have all the locations here to be occupied by the DRAM cell. So this is called open bit line architecture. The key is that the same sample is shared between arrays or between banks. So then in this case, if you look at the cell, each cell, theoretically, you only have one word line and one bit line. Right? This is bit line true, because the bit line C is coming from the other bank, doesn't matter. So then here, one cell, theoretically you have 2F and 2F. So you get 4F square. And in reality, because you have to fit in the bit line contact, it will give you 6F square. We will look at that in the next slide. But theoretically speaking, with the open bit line architecture, you can go to 4F square. And this is the future trend. We will briefly talk about that later. If you build your access transistor vertically, using the vertical, like a gate all around transistor, you can achieve this 4F square. It's not demonstrated in production yet, but that is one of the future directions for the industry to go.
to go to the, this 4F square architecture. So any questions here, we will look at more details in the next few slides. Uh, so the question is, can we use other like a uh, constant bias, like a voltage or current bias to function as the reference, right? So the answer is yes, but from the routing point of view, you want to use the adjacent rows or columns to do the reference. Otherwise, you cannot achieve this high density like from the layout point of view. If you have to distribute your like bias from external circuitry somewhere, right? Then you have to use wires to, to distribute that, and the wires will take space, so it's not efficient from the layout point of view. So you that's why in the memory array design you always use dummy rows or dummy columns to function as a reference. That's that is very typical for most kinds of memory. Okay, so then here are thus two distinct features, 8F square versus the 4 or 6F square between those two architectures. But then the folded bit architecture do have one advantage. That is, uh, it has better common mode rejection to the noise. This is because those two inputs to the sense amp coming from the same array. So it's a differential input. And you know if you have the noise, probably the noise will be similar in adjacent columns. So that means the common mode of the noise can be rejected by the differential input of the sense amp. And if you have the open bit architecture, then you take the input from two arrays. Then the two arrays may have very different noise pattern then the noise sensitivity will be poor and will be i mean sensitivity will be high so that's the only downside of the open bit line architecture all right so this is a summary of the open versus folding bit line architecture i think i covered all the points here so i will not uh, repeat this is just a summary in text So for today's standalone DRAM, it's always open bit line architecture and uh, approaching 6F square. And we will see some of the examples next. But before that, let's look at the folded bit line architecture. This is one example to show the 8F square layout. And this is the open bit line architecture. If you draw the circuit diagram, then you have those uh, 1T, 1C cell, and then you have the adjacent columns to give you the sense amp, like one is T, one is C. And then you have this twisted location of the cell. That means here you have empty space. So if you really translate that into the layout on the right hand side, this is what you see typically. So in this case, this is the word line the red one, and also, of course, the blue ones are overlain. And then here you have the bitman, T and bitman C. So here, as we discussed, typically two D runs share the same bitman contact, but they are controlled by different variants. So that means here, if you look at this one and this one, so you have the, this is a transistor, right? This is another transistor. So they share the same contact. They share the same contact. This is the contact to the bit line. And then here, this circle, this green circle, is your capacitor, punch, for example. So then, this is the empty space you have to leave for the. So the bit architecture 
so we cannot have the cells here because we have to leave this space. So this is a sorted pattern architecture, and one cell. If you look at, if you draw the unit cell region, so this contains one cell. And on the horizontal side, you have two F because you have bit line, the space in between bit line. And, and then on the horizontal uh, vertical side, you see you have four F because here you have two word line give you two F. And then this here in the middle, this uh, pastor give you F. And then the contact on this side give you half F. Half F, 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 F. So here you share this empty space between the adjacent cell, so you have another half F. So in total, you have four F on this side. So that's why you have eight F, eight F square. Or if, if you want to look at this simply, this is, uh, you can start from here, then you have two wires on one direction and one wire on the another direction. Two wires give you four F, four F, and one wire give you two F. So in total, you have eight F, F, eight F square. The key is that here, this is wasted, this area here. And then next, let's look at the 6x square. So this is the 6x square. And theoretically, we say that this is the 4f square. But in reality, you have to use 6 F square. The reason is that you have to make the bit line contact. So the, actually the trick here is the, the channel direction needs to be tilted. So the channel and the gate will not be perpendicular. So if you look at this one, still this is word line horizontally and bit line is vertically. And then here, this is like one cell. So let me draw it out. So basically here, what you need to do is, first let's say draw a word line. Right? And then you have bit line. But you need to make a bit line contact somewhere. So let's say the bit line contact is here. So that means the source, for example, of the transistor. And then you need to make an, if you, you have to relate the layout with your transistor schematic, right? So let's do the schematic here. So then you have word line. Word line should control a transistor, like this. And the transistor, one side is, will connect to the bit line. And the other side will attached to the storage node capacitor, right? So this is the, the D1 cell. So this side is a contact, bit line contact. Then where is the capacitor? So the big key part here is that the capacitor is a standing up, is a stacked capacitor. If you recall, the stacked capacitor is sitting on top. Therefore, that capacitor will have to avoid the word line and bit line because it's standing up, right? So you cannot do it here because that will conflict with the bit line. The capacitor is standing up. And then you have to avoid the word line and bit line. So that means you have to do the capacitor here. So this is the bit line contact. And this is your SN cap. Have, you have to make it here. So that means your channel direction is tilted. This is like your source and drain direction. And word line is not perpendicular to this channel direction. direction. And this gives you one cell. Right here, you, you correlate with the schematic. This gives you one cell. And if you look at this cell's layout, 
this is 2f, this is 3f, and that's how you get 6f squared. And uh, in the future, we want to go to f, 4f squared, and we'll discuss that later. So the key is that you have to make the transistor vertical, and then the transistor source and the drain will, from the top view, all of them will occupy the same slot here. So if the transistor is standing up, and your capacitor is also standing up, and then they two overlap vertically, then you can go to this 4f square eventually. And we will discuss that uh, maybe next uh, lecture. So any questions? So the key is that for the industry mainstream 6f square layout, you have to tilt the channel direction. And the word line will not be perpendicular to the channel. And you have to uh, basically avoid the word line and bit line when you draw the d run cell capacitor. So let's look at some of the real examples from the industry. So this is uh, from Samsung. I proposed uh, many years ago. And this is uh, the layout in this particular design. And here you see the wire lamp horizontally and bit lamp is uh, yellow vertically. And then the active area is uh, where the channel locates. Active area means the source and the drain and then channel. So the, in this case, it's tilted this way. And you can look at the layout by yourself. I will not repeat that. But this is one, one cell, basically. And then you have 2F horizontally and 3F vertically. And then here, this is the bit line contact. And the other one, this white circle, is the storage node capacitor. And that one will avoid the word line and the bit line. Because this one eventually will standing up like this, right? So your, your word line and bit line will, will be underneath. So we have to avoid that. You can have different designs, actually. So here, this is another design by this company called Kimonda. Actually, this company bankrupt uh, in 2009, I believe. So, but this was spin off from Infineon, and Infineon is spin off from Siemens, I believe. But anyway, this is a, a, a one of the companies that proposed this buried wireline device concept, very important for the DRAM industry. Anyway, so here this is the, the uh, design, and still you have a tilted channel direction. And in this case, you have 2F here and 3F here. But here we have this so-called isolating word line. So if, if you look at the uh, layout, so there's another word line somewhere here. This is dummy. This is uh, not the real word line. This is dummy. So then if you look at the word, word line here, Actually, those two word lines only have 2F, but from this word line to the real word line here, you have 4F. So on average, between those two cells, you have 3F in this direction. So there will be a little bit difference here between this one and this one. You can find some subtle difference. For this one, the word line, actually, for this one, the word line teaches 2F, and bit line teaches 3F. But for this one, the word line pitch is uh, like uh, on average 3F, and bit line pitch is 2F. So this is because there are different ways to design this. So you can make this uh, word line like a 3F or 2F. You can also make like 2F and 3F this way. Doesn't matter. So you, in total, you get 6F square. So different companies may have their own design. And finally, this is another proposal from Micron. I don't believe this one is still used uh, today. But this is one, another variant of the design. So you can make the bit lamps twisted a little bit. And then you, you can have the channel of the 
adjacent cell in this kind of opposite uh, direction. So this one is tilting to the left, this tilting to the right. So the good part of this design is that the active area, sometimes they call it island, uh, this area is continuous. If you look at the channel, if you follow the gray part, in this case, the channel will be continuous. But in the previous designs, they will have the island of the active area. So you have this one area, another area, another area, another area. And between you should have this isolating wear land to separate those two active channel regions. So sometimes they call this island of the active area. So in this particular design, then they twist it so you can have the active channel continuous, but then the beat line will also be twisted in this case. But again, this is like a, a 2f by 3f give you like 6f square. Uh, we are right about to stop here. Any questions? One question from online. This still have isolating wear line. So I believe this micron design has have the uh, isolating wear line, and this Kimonda design also have uh, isolating wear line. But for this Samsung design, uh, I don't think it has the uh, isolating word line in this particular case because word line here is very word line only has 2f. I should not have this isolating word line. So in this case, the word line has 2f and word line is already very compact. You don't have the isolating word line in this case. Okay, so that's for today's lecture. <laughs>